Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for tuning in via Zoom for our session this afternoon. My name is Dr. Joshua Slee. I'm the Division Head of Sciences and Math here at DeSales University, and I'm also a faculty in the biology department. Before we get into our panel discussion of should you patent, I would like to invite our president, Father Jim Greenfield, uh, to lead us with a blessing. Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm going to take my mask off. I want to especially welcome all of us who are here in Heard Auditorium and for those who are Zooming in for this very exciting scholar series. I'm delighted, too, that uh, we have so many uh, wonderful people that uh, Dr. Josh Lee is going to introduce, um, but I'm especially delighted that Paul, that Tracy, Steve, Keith, and Ed are going to be with us. They are uh, distinguished alums. Well, Ed's not an alum. Uh, but we're, we're thrilled that uh, all of them will be with us. I like to start with a prayer, uh, and it's called a prayer for curiosity. Since we are talking about patents, and you know, usually patents are what is the end product of people's creativity and trying to put some kind of um, legal surrounding around it, I thought I would begin with this prayer for curiosity. So as we do with all things at the sales, let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we confess our rigidity. It requires work to ask questions. It requires effort to see a point of view from another. It requires humility to challenge our assumptions. It requires waiting to hear from you. Honestly, we lack the resources at times to simply change on our own. And so we pray for curiosity. Give us open minds and hearts Release us from the cynicism that pervades our perspective. Move us from obstinance to pliability. Ultimately, we ask you to let us see what you see. The good news of the gospel motivates our curiosity. You are the God making everything new. We experience the cross when you put to death our sin and brokenness. You offer us new life through the resurrection. Provide us the faith like children, to ask more questions than making statements. Today, make us curious. Remind us of the power of your gospel. Move us from being static to dynamic and let our curiosity see you in ways we have never seen you before. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. And thank you once again, everyone, for coming. And i now like to turn it back over to Dr. Josh Slee. Thank you, Father Jim. Uh, two pieces of organizational business before we get started today. We are experiencing some high winds here in Center Valley. So if we happen to have a little blip in our power, give us a few minutes, we'll restart the Zoom session and try that link again. And then also after our panel discussion, we'll have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, don't be afraid to put those into the chat uh, and we'll see that our moderator gets those questions so that they can be answered. I would like to welcome our panelists and introduce our moderator who will be leading today's discussion. Paul T. Michael John is a member of Allentown College first graduating class of 1969. He's a partner at Dorsey and Whitney's Intellectual Property Litigation Practice Group with more than 40 years of experience in intellectual property litigation and prosecution. And he routinely oversees large sale cases for Dorsey's clients. Paul has been first chair litigator in more than 150 infringement litigations and handled IP litigations in district courts throughout the country, the International Trade Commission and the Patent Office Trial and Appeal Board. He has also handled appeals in the federal circuit and regional courts circuits. For the last two decades, Paul has been adjunct professor, professor at the University of Washington School of Law, where he teaches a course on patent infringement litigation. Paul has presented seminars all over the world on IP, especially patent topics of interest. Please welcome Paul Michael John, and he will introduce our other panelists. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Slee, for the introduction, and uh, Father Greenfield for your prayer and kind words. Uh, we have a great uh, subject matter today. I want to welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to talk about what a patent is and how you get one and what you can do with it after you get, after you have it. We have terrific panel here today to speak to this topic. 
We have two patent attorneys, I'm one, and the other is uh, Tracy Durkin. And we have three inventors, actual real inventors. So uh, let me talk, uh, let me introduce Tracy Durkin uh, to you. Um, Tracy has terrific experience for this panel. She was not only, she's not only in at private practice, but prior to, to uh, joining her law firm, she was a patent examiner at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So she's sort of seen both sides of this uh, coin for, in terms of uh, getting a patent. She is the head of the mechanical patents uh, group at her firm, which is called Stern Kessler in Washington, DC. She's also head of the design patent group there. She's very, very well known for her design patent work. Uh, for example, one of her clients is Apple. And she obtained a design patent for Apple, which was asserted in the so-called so uh, cell, cell phone wars between Apple and Samsung. And one of the patents that Tracy obtained uh, was uh, found to be valid and infringed by Samsung. And the court awarded uh, Apple over $500 million damages for infringement of that patent. But most important, uh, Tracy is married to a, a Sales University alum, uh, uh, Kevin Durkin, class of 1985. So now let me tell you about the three uh, inventors we have with us. The first is uh, Steve Apresco. Steve is uh, my classmate from the class of 1969 of Allentown College. He was a chemistry major like I was. Uh, he then went on to work for uh, RCA and um, that RCA's business division where Steve worked was purchased by a number of companies over the years, but Steve stayed with that particular uh, business unit um, throughout his uh, career. Steve is, has uh, uh, about 24 United States patents and about 17 international patents. And he's got a bunch of technical um, publications in the electronics and structural mechanics field. Uh, for the last 13 years, Steve has uh, consulted for the United States Army, the United States Air Force, and various United States and Canadian corporations. So it's a real pleasure to have Steve with us. Uh, second, we, we have uh, Dr. Keith Rothschild. Uh, Keith has a bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering from Carnegie Mellon uh, University. He's got a master's of business administration from DeSales University, and he's got a PhD from North Central University. Keith is a senior uh, principal engineer for Cox Communications. Uh, he has been a uh, senior member of IEEE, and over the last 20 years, he's made uh, significant contributions to the telecommunications industry. Uh, Keith has over two dozen uh, uh, patents. And finally, we have Ed Zapax. Ed has a master's and uh, a BS and a master's degree from Shippensburg University in education with a major in chemistry. He went to work for Roman Hawes in the uh, Springhouse uh, facility in Philadelphia. He worked there for 21 years as a research chemist synthesizing various compounds. And um, he has a number of patents on the compounds that he synthesized. Ed spent nine years uh, teaching chemical technology at Upper Bucks County Technical School in Prakasi. Ed's a loyal patron of the Sales University's Act One theater program. So that's our uh, panel for today. I, I wanted to uh, give you just a little bit of basics of what a patent is uh, very uh, broadly, a few basic comments about patents, and then we'll turn it over to the other panelists. First of all, uh, Lipitor is a drug you've probably heard of. I think most people have heard of that. It's a sort of combats your bad cholesterol, you know, when you have it. It's a, it's a drug that was invented by Pfizer. Uh, um, it, Pfizer got a patent on Lipitor 
And between the years 1997 and 2011, Pfizer received revenue of over $100 billion for the sale of that drug. And the reason it could make that kind of uh, money, get that kind of revenue, is because Pfizer had a patent on Lipitor. Uh, and a patent means basically a monopoly. It's a legal monopoly, unlike the illegal monopolies that we know are so bad. So, um, so with this monopoly, it, it was the sole source of Lipitor for that period of time I mentioned. So a patent is an exclusive right. It's an exclusive property right. You can exclude others from making, using, or selling your invention. And as a matter of fact, while uh, Lipitor was on patent, uh, the price per month of a prescription was roughly $160. Once Lipitor went off patent and other companies called generic companies could get in and sell the product, the price went down from $160 a month to $18 a month. So you can see the value of, of, of patents. So it's an exclusive right given to an inventor by the United <laughs> States government in exchange for what the inventor gives to the government. What the in inventor gives to the government is a detailed description of its invention. And that invention has to be new and un unobvious. You can't have an invention of something that's already in the public domain. You can only get patents on inventions that are not in the public domain. It not only can't be the same thing as something that's in the public domain, but it can't be an obvious variant of what's in the public domain. So your invention must be new and unobvious and you have to describe it in the patent itself. Uh, the Patent monopoly is for a limited period of time. Uh, it's used to be 17 years from the issuance of the patent. Now it's 20 years from the filing of the patent. Um, one misconception about patents is that it gives you the right to make, use, and sell your invention. And it doesn't always do that. Normally you can make, use, and sell your own invention, but sometimes you can't. Let me give you an example. And this is an example of like a generic patent, we call it and an improvement patent. Let's say I'm a caveman back you know, a long time ago and uh, every, my cave is about a mile from the river. So every day I have to go down to the river and get water. And I drink the water and I wash myself with the water and I wash my clothes in the water. And then I get thirsty a little bit later in the afternoon and I have to go, go down there again to get some more water. So anyway, it uh, gets me thinking, that's a problem. What can I do about it? So I come up with a solution. The solution is a bucket. I call my invention a bucket. So I carry a bucket down to the river, fill it with water, bring it back to my cave, and I only have to go to the river once a day instead of maybe four or five times a day. So that's an invention. It's called a generic invention because it co covers all buckets, whether they are big or little or high or low. Uh, with handles or without handles, et cetera. It's, it's uh, a generic patent. Then one of my neighbors in another cave sees me bringing that bucket back every day and thinks, hey, I've got an improvement to that uh, invention. I'm going to, I have invented a bucket with a handle on it. Because if I have a handle on it, instead of carrying one bucket back that mile, I can carry two pretty easily with the handle. So both of them apply for patents. One gets a generic patent on bucket, all buckets, whether they have handles or not. Uh, and the other gets a uh, patent on a bucket with a handle. Now, the problem in that case is they, they now both want to sell buckets with handles. They don't care about the buckets anymore because the buckets with handles are much better. So they both want to do it. But the problem is neither can do it. Uh, the first inventor, the guy who invented bucket, can't do it because the second inventor has a patent on a bucket with handles. And the second inventor can't sell a bucket with handles because the first guy has a patent on buckets and a bucket with a handle is a bucket. So what they do is they get together and they say, hey, if you let me use your patent, I'll let you use mine. And they agree to that. They have what's called a license, actually a cross license. 
The first gives the uh, second inventor a license to use his patent. Second inventor gives the first inventor a, a right to use uh, his patent too. So sometimes uh, when you make an invention, you always have the right to exclude everybody else from making, using or selling that invention. But sometimes you don't have the right to actually make use or sell it yourself and you need to have a cross license. Now, what can be um, patented? Just about anything that's man-made can be patented. There's a few very narrow exceptions. One is abstract ideas. Another is, um, is natural phenomenon. And a third is scientific principles. You can't patent them. They've sort of been in the public domain forever. So you can't really take them out of the public domain. But everything else, whether it's an apparatus, a device, a system, a chemical compound like Ed's invented or, or pharmaceutical compositions like, like Pfizer invented or methods of making or methods of using uh, these devices, they can all be patented. And uh, if we get the uh, first slide up, uh, please, Daniel. I want to remind you that patents can be uh, valuable. As I mentioned, uh, with the Libertor patent, $100 billion in revenue. Uh, there's also a, a lawsuit um, a, uh, and a trial uh, about two weeks ago where a very small company called uh, VLSI sued Intel, which is the big computer chip company, uh, and uh, for infringement of VLSI's patents. And these patents were on computer chips certain kind of uh, specialized computer chips. And they sued them in West Texas uh, federal court. And the jury decided at the end of the trial, uh -huh. that yes, Intel did infringe. And they awarded a judgment of $2.1 billion uh, against Intel for that lawsuit. So that shows you that patents really have a lot of power. Not only, not only can you get damages for past infringement, you can get an injunction for future infringement. Yeah, that is, you can stop uh, the company from making this product in the future. Now, I just want to give you an example of what a patent is. Uh, before you is um, a shot of a three-page patent. Now, remember I said that some patents are commercially vi viable, commercially valuable. About one in 5,000 patents are commercially valuable. This is not one of them. This is a, a method for concealing partial blindness, or excuse me, partial baldness. Uh, three pages, uh, just go over those three pages very quickly. So this is the cover sheet on the left-hand side. It tells you it's a US patent. Uh, slightly below that, it tells you the names of the inventors. Notice you can have two inventors. You can have one or two or sometimes 10. And the two inventors are Frank and Donald Smith. They made this invention of method of concealing partial baldness. On the right-hand column, it gives you the patent number, 4,022,227. Today, we have more than 10 million patents in existence. So you know we've come a long way since May 10, 1977, when this patent issued. And then a little bit below that, you have the identification of the patent examiner at the patent office who examined this patent. It's uh, G.E. Uh, McNeil, or G.E. McNeil. And then you have the name of the attorney who represented the patent applicant, the, the Smith brothers in this case, uh, John Dickman. So if we go to the next page, uh, most patents have pictures in it. And the pictures show you how the invention works. And sometimes it shows what the prior art's like. So in this case, you got a guy who's bald. That's in figure one. And that's a full face view of the guy who's bald in figure one. Figure two to the right of that is a side view of the guy who's bald. And figure three, which is below figure one, shows a top view of the guy who's bald. So that's the problem. He's bald. And figures four, five, and six show the invention solution to that problem. In figure four, you take the hair that's behind your head and, and comb it forward so it covers the bald spot. And in figure five, you take the hair from the right-hand side of your head and, and comb it to the left-hand side to, to cover it more. And figure six, you do the same thing from the, with the hair from, from the left side of your head. 
and voila, after uh, figure six, you now have somebody who looks like, um, you know, George Clooney. Uh, so that's the second page. That's the um, that's the drawings, which sort of show you how the invention works and what the prior art was like. Now, if we go to the last page very quickly, it's hard to read this, so I'll uh, just explain it very quickly. On the left-hand side, there are two, two uh, headings, which are basically in every pack. One is called background of the invention. That's the top of the left-hand column. And the next one is the summary of the invention. And in this case, uh, so what normally patents, what we normally do in patents is that we describe the problem in the prior art. And in this, that's the background of the invention. And in, in this case, the problem in the prior art was um, that it was expensive. It was expensive to try to cure this problem of partial baldness. Uh, the way they did it was with hair transplants or hair weaving or um, maybe a toupee, a hair piece, you know? But that's expensive. What about the guy who's bald, but also poor? Well, that's what this invention's for. And, and the summary of the invention talks about how a poor guy can, uh, can uh, help his partial baldness. And the way you do it basically is comb your hair over. <laughs> So um, the next section is a description of the drawings. There were six figures and there's six, uh, six descriptions here of those figures. Then there's a detailed description of the invention. It talks about how you comb it one way, then comb it in another. And then at the very, uh, very, almost the very bottom, about two thirds of the way down, there's a section that talks about I claim. It really should say we claim because there's two Smiths on this uh, as co-inventors of this. And um, th there's then five numbered paragraphs, one, two, three, four, and five. And they are what we call the claims. And I, I, the, one of the reasons I brought this patent up is to show you what a claim is. A claim is like a plot of land. Uh, it's like real estate. Whereas real estate is tangible, intellectual property is intangible. But nevertheless, the court talks about a patent claim as measuring the meets and bounds of the invention. In other words, what the boundaries are, that meets and bounds is uh, real estate language. So the claim, if you can envision it as a plot of land with a fence around it, and anybody who climbs that fence and jumps into that plot of land is an infringer, a patent infringer, like Intel was and you might have to pay a judgment of $2.1 billion. So, so that's what the claim is. That tells you what the invention is. That claim should distinguish over what we call the prior art, what came before it. Like nobody combed their hair like this before, presumably. So um, I mentioned that uh, a, a patent is uh, valuable. This is not one of the valuable ones. This is one of the 4,999 out of 5,000 that's not valuable. One reason it's not valuable is you never know if somebody's an infringer or not, unless you see them combing their hair. And if you do that, then you'd have to file a lawsuit. And we'll see later on that lawsuits are expensive, maybe one to $2 million for a lawsuit. Um, so are you really going to get a, much of a return on money because you happen to see on your investment because you happen to see a friend who's combing their hair in a way that you think infringes your patent? Probably not. So anyway, there's three kinds of patents, basically utility patents, design patents, and plant patents. We've talked about utility patents. Utility patents are things that protect a utility combing your hair this way to, uh, uh, to take care of your partial baldness is a utilitarian function. Design patents protect uh, ornamental features and plant patents uh, protect new and unobvious plants. So for example, you couldn't get a, a, a plant patent on a rose because they're in the prior art. You can't get one on a daisy because that's in the prior art then maybe you can get a patent on a hybrid of a rose and a daisy, because that's maybe not in the prior art. I don't, I, I don't know. So let's talk about the second kind of patents, design patents. 
uh, and Tracy is probably one of the most um, qualified persons in the country to talk about them. Uh, Tracy? Sure, thank you. Um, thanks, Paul, and, and thanks to DeSales University for having me today. As Paul mentioned, I'm not an alum, but I've been married to one for 30 years, so I have a special affinity for the university. And I also wanted to mention, I uh, did not go to college to become a patent attorney, um, but I became one because I went to college uh, and sat in on a lecture like this. Uh, and it inspired me. I was actually studying textile engineering. I was gonna go become an engineer like three of the other speakers on the panel and um, ended up going to work for the US Patent Office and uh, went to law school, became an attorney and the rest is history. Uh, so who knows who in the audience might become a patent attorney someday. So uh, uh, as Paul mentioned, there are three kinds of patents. Um, I'm gonna just give you a brief introduction to design patents. Uh, it's where I've been spending a big part of my career for the past 30 years. Um, if we could put the slide up for, the, for a second, that would be great. I'm just waiting for it to get up here. Okay, with a little bit of a delay. I don't see it yet. Can anyone see it? I can see it. You can? Okay. Yep. I can't. So I will look at my own version as I go through it. But hopefully what you're looking at is a... Um, Maybe that's coming up there. I, I don't know. Anyway, um, hopefully what you can see is a slide that says utility and design patents. On the left-hand side is one of those claims that Paul was talking about for utility patent. And on the right-hand side is the design patent claim uh, and a picture from the design patent. And you can see that um, there's some similarity between the two, but there's a lot of differences. So this is an example of two different patents, a utility patent and a design patent that are covering the same product. And this is a, a patent that we obtained for PepsiCo on their Drinkfinity bottle. And so you can see the design patent is really all about what the, what the product looks like. And, and it's important to keep in mind that there is this other kind of patent because in today's world where consumer products are so in, important and distinguishing the look of your product from others as a way to differentiate what would otherwise be pretty fungible products in the marketplace, design patents are a great way to do that. They don't last for 20 years like utility patents do. They only last for 15 years. But um, that term extends from the grant to the patent as opposed to the filing date. So 15 years is a pretty long time. In fact, I've only had a couple of products outlive their 15 year um, patent term. And one of them is a sneaker that's still sold by Rockport today, uh, which is kind of neat when I still see that in the market. There's a second slide on here that um, hopefully you can go to and somebody will give me a thumbs up that they can see that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so I wanted to, to uh, just show you this slide because design patents, not design patents, patents in general don't, don't just cover um, three-dimensional objects or chemical um, uh, compositions. They can also cover things like software. Uh, and so here's an example on the left-hand side of a utility patent for the slide to unlock feature, which you might remember was a big deal when the Apple iPhone originally came out in 2007. And then on the left, on the right hand side are two examples from design patents for um, that slide to unlock feature. And you can see that the way the design is depicted in the utility patent is much more conceptual. The design patent looks much more like how the product or the software actually ended up, um, uh, you know, how it was presented to, to consumers. And then I have one more slide uh, that I just wanted to show you. Hopefully I'll get a thumbs up and you can see that. Thank you. Uh, and these are just three iconic design patents that I thought it was kind of fun to, to look at. The first one is actually the Statue of Liberty. Believe it or not, Bertholi uh, patented the Statue of Liberty before he brought it to the United States as a way to make money uh, by selling little tiny miniatures. This patent obviously, I mean, who needed to cover the giant statue? Who was gonna copy that? But this was uh, to prevent copies of little miniatures, which he sold to raise the money to actually bring the statue to the United States. So that's a fun one. And I actually have a picture of that hanging in my office. Um, the other is the redesign of the um, 
the Volkswagen Beetle, and then of course the original iPhone design patent. So hopefully that just gives you a little perspective on, on the, this idea that um, you, know, you don't have to necessarily be an engineer to invent and get a patent. You can be a graphic designer, you can be an industrial designer, or even a fine arts uh, major uh, and still be able to patent your work. So with that, I will turn it back over to Paul. Thanks very much, Tracy. Hey, uh, one point I'd like to make, uh, uh, Tracy mentioned about how she got into uh, becoming a patent attorney. You can be a patent agent without being an attorney. You don't have to go to law school. You just have to have enough formal scientific um, uh, background that you can take uh, what's called the patent bar, bar exam. Uh, it's kind of a tough exam. Uh, you have to prepare for it a little bit. Uh, but basically, all you need to do to, to get patents for your clients in the patent office is to have sufficient uh, 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 scientific uh, formal education and also pass this bar exam, and then you become a patent agent. And then if later on you decide to go to law school, you can become a patent attorney. And Tracy, we, we, we're normally holding uh, um, questions till the end, but we got one that's kind of very relevant, I think, to what you just talked about. And it has to do with other kinds of intellectual property. Now, we know patents are only one branch of intellectual property. There's typically thought to be four branches. There's patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. And we're talking today pretty much only about, about um, patents. But the question was, what's the difference between a design patent and copyright uh, infringement in terms of infringement? What is the test uh, for design patent infringement and what's the test for copyright infringement? It's a now, great question. It's a great question. We didn't prepare for this, so, but we'll see how good Tracy is on her feet. Uh, uh, this is easy. So um, design patent infringement, the test is whether or not the patented design and the accused product are substantially similar. So they don't have to be identical, but it all has to do with, with um, similarity of look. Copyright, on the other hand, in order to prove infringement, you have to prove that someone copied. So they have to have known about your copyrighted design in order for there to be infringement. So the big difference is that you could innocently infringe a patent. There's no intent to have copied. Uh, and whereas on copyright, you have to have known about the design and then, and then the design that you created has to be basically the same or kind of substantially similar. So the, the baseline tests are the same, but how you get there are very different. There's, there's no innocent infringement uh, defense for patents where there would be for copyright. Okay, thanks very much. And, and now what we're gonna do is sort of go through chronologically uh, from the very beginning to the very end on how you get the idea, how you, uh, prepare a patent application, how it's prosecuted in the patent office, and when it issues, how you can enforce it in both a friendly way, which we call licensing, and an unfriendly way, which we call litigation. So let me start with Ed. Ed, uh, you've done a lot of research at Roman Hawes and have a number of patents in the, on chemical compounds used for insecticides and herbicides and uh, fungicides. Um, can you describe the process of invention? And is there normally an kind of an aha moment where, where, when a light bulb goes off, or is it more a process of trial and error? Okay. Um, th thank you, Paul. Um, I'll describe uh, the process of uh, invention to get to the aha moment, and then I'll make uh, a comment on the matter of trial and error at the end. So uh, to describe the, uh, the process of invention, uh, first, uh, for me at least, what I did, um, a written proposal of the, of the invention, the idea, would be done. And, and uh, this would, uh, of course, uh, uh, include the conceived idea and this, as a chemist proposal, is evidence of the conception of the invention. Second, uh, laboratory synthesis, which is the making of uh, the compounds which were in the proposal, because my target would be compounds that uh, 
are uh, used on agricultural crops. Uh, since I was in the agricultural research and division of uh, Roman Haas, um, that would be my uh, goal line target. And to use football terminology, that would be uh, you know something that showed uh, activity when it was tested. Um, so compounds would be made and they would be fully characterized by anal analytical instruments. And uh, they would then be uh, sent for some testing. Let's say for simplicity's sake, uh, I've made five compounds, you know, from the proposed uh, uh, idea, invention. Those five compounds, uh, you know, go for testing in the greenhouse. And in the greenhouse, we're looking for activity uh, to uh, prevent plant disease, to uh, perhaps um, uh, stop insect damage from happening, uh, and also prevent weeds from growing possibly, you know, uh, in a farmer's crop. If I um, had a, a good proposal um, and, uh, a little luck involved here as well, but there are, there's uh, you know strong evidence um, or um, strong reasoning you know for the proposal. But let's say uh, for the first five compounds, they show some activity in the greenhouse on plant disease. That would be my aha moment because uh, to see activity is difficult to find, difficult to get, and. Uh, um, so that would be my aha moment. I think with the invention and the different stages of invention, uh, and the different types of invention, even in the utility patent itself, uh, people would have uh, different aha moments along the way, maybe at different times. But the thrill and excitement, that aha moment, or if you want to call it eureka moment, you know, like Archimedes in the bathtub, um, said Eureka, and um, that would be, uh, like I said, my aha moment. Uh, next step in the process, if uh, eventually if the compounds uh, were found to be uh, efficacious, effective, uh, let's say against plant diseases, um, uh, a patent application would be filed uh, for these novel compounds, uh, having you know this unique activity for these compounds. By US law, the filing of a patent application uh, constitutes reduction to practice. The company at some point after this um, patent application filing, a uh, decision to uh, commercialize a product would have to be made. Uh, the cost of research and development, R&D, is cost millions of dollars uh, for a drug company, for an agriculture research company, and uh, the patent, patent protection would be needed uh, to recoup uh, these expenses and to earn a profit as well. Uh, to uh, address the, the last part of the, the question asked by Paul here, uh, is a matter of, uh, is the is uh, uh, invention uh, uh, route um, uh, a matter of trial and error? Um, I always say that if you uh, are doing good science research to get there, it's not just haphazard. You know, you've done your homework, you've done uh, uh, prior art, um, um, examination, you keep up with literature, the journals, etc., and uh, with creativity, uh, and also perhaps using molecular modeling, which enters into uh, trying to design compounds that have um, activity for agriculture use. Um, so strong proposals come from, um, you know, good scientific reasoning. And uh, always remain optimistic and don't get discouraged. Remember, even if something doesn't uh, fails, you really haven't failed. It just shows that that doesn't work. 
And uh, you probably want multi projects going on, maybe three to five projects. The project I mentioned would not be the only one. Okay, back to Paul. Well, thanks very much, Ed. That's a great explanation. Um, Steve, I was wondering what makes an, an inventor and why do you sometimes have more than one, one inventor? Remember the patent we looked at with the Smith brothers there, the two of them thought of this ingenious way of combing your hair when you're partially bald. So what is an inventor? You, 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 when you're at work there with RCA, you've got a boss and you got some other people that help you with stuff. Maybe some people make prototypes for you, that kind of thing. How do you decide who's the inventor and who isn't? And what is an inventor? A lot of questions, but. Well, an inventor is basically a warm body. I mean, as was mentioned earlier, any, any, anybody can, can be an inventor. Now, there are certain traits though, or characteristics that you really have to have a handle on in order to make it work. You have to be able to think analytically kind of look at all the data that Ed said, you go out and, and collect, look at cause and effect and assimilate it all to see what it's telling you. And is it telling you something new? Uh, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's only a few Teslas and uh, Edison's in the world. So, you know, but that doesn't mean you can't do what they did. You, you can, but you have to be able to think and make things look reasonable. The next piece is you better be able to communicate. You, you, you can have the greatest invention since peanut butter, but if you can't communicate that idea, it goes nowhere. And, and it goes nowhere for several reasons. And that brings me to my next point. You gotta have financial backing from somewhere. It's not cheap to file a patent. It's not cheap to do the research and everything else to end up being able to patent the idea. I mean, you got to spend the buck to make a buck. And it's, it's amazing how many dollars cross hands because of what goes on and whether or not people can or cannot communicate and have a financial backer. Because let's face it, your financial backer can be who you're working for, okay? If you can't convince the boss that this is a great idea, why should he spend more money on it? You could have a rich, a rich uncle somewhere, but you better hope he has gazillions of dollars because it's gonna take that. Another possibility is the government. Now, I don't know all the programs that exist in the government to try and get money, but the Department of Defense has their wish list. It's, a, it's referred to as an SBIR, Small Business Invention Research. And basically what happens is they put out a series of topics on there that their people have worked on, but they don't wanna to spend tons of money to bring in a whole division to keep the work going. So they give you an opportunity to make a statement about what you think you can do to help them. You submit that, you may compete with a half a dozen or, or nine other people on that particular project. And if they like what you say, they give you a grant. And that grant can be anywhere from $100,000 to millions of dollars. And what's kind of nice about it is you patent anything during that time, you own it, not the government, unless they get really real sticky, but that's, that's part of what they let happen. So anyway, um, <clears throat> there it is. A warm body, you gotta think, you gotta communicate, you gotta have money. Thanks very much, Steve. And, and you have to keep in mind that, that the inventor is the person or persons who uh, come up with the concept of the invention. 
so it, it, uh, it's not uh, necessarily your boss just because you work for that person. Uh, you might like to uh, give, uh, uh, you know, give that honor to your boss, but in the United States, you have to get the, 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 the inventor has to be the person who came up with the concept. And sometimes it's more than one person who can come up with it. You might back, you might bet certain ideas back and forth between two people or three people or four people, like the Smith brothers did it with respect to the hair. Oh, shall we do it from left to right or right to left? You know, and so you can have co-inventors. So good. So that's what an inventor is, as uh, and uh, as um, Steve explained, and and also keep in mind that it's the. Uh, person or persons who come up with the concept of the invention. Hey, ben, yeah. um, I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe I, ask sure. I, I, I tend to think about uh, multiple inventors, like two guys going out or two gals going out and buying a car. You go out and you get the title to the car, you spend your money to get it, and both your names are on the title. That means either of you can drive that car wherever you want. Either of you can decide they're going to use it to deliver pizzas and make money. But only that person who delivers the pizzas keeps the money. However, if you go to the next stage and you want to let somebody else use the car, then you both have to be involved. You both have to agree that they can get the car. Otherwise, you'll be litigating your partner. There is a difference between the, the inventor of the, the patent and the owner of the patent. A lot of times with the inventor of the patent, especially uh, those of us who work for, for companies, um, I don't actually own the patents that I'm an, an inventor uh, on. So I am not actually involved in any of the litigation or giving people rights or licensing um, you know, um, of those patents. Um, a lot of my patents, I do have co-inventors, co, co and what that really is, is that we work together. You know, the patents are often, they often have multiple components, um, and, um, you know, each of us has contributed some aspect uh, to the claim set, and, and we keep very detailed records about, you know, what parts of the claims each of us actually contributed that collectively makes the invention novel, um, and as the patent gets prosecuted, you know, it, oftentimes the claims, uh, the claim sets evolve, and we have to make sure that the um, whatever the final claim set is, the inventors are accurate. You know, the um, Paul mentioned earlier. You know, it might be nice to put your boss on it. Actually, having an inventor listed on a patent who isn't an inventor on the claim set can can be a reason to invalidate the patent. So we, we have to be very um, you know careful. One of the questions that's come up. Um, you know, is um, for, for the inventors, can artificial intelligence uh, be an inventor? And we've, we've heard a number of times, you know, a warm body, right, um, has to come up with, with, a, with the uh, novel idea. It has to be a person. Artificial intelligence is a tool, uh, especially as it exists today and can be used to, to help, um, you know, refine the ideas. Um, but it's actually the person who's, who's fine tuning or, or programming that, uh, or directing that tool who's the inventor, not the artificial intelligence itself. So it's really is the, the, um, the person or people who are contributing the novel concepts that are the enabling components of the invention. Yeah, usually with companies, when you walk through the door and they hire you, the first thing they ask you to do is sign a document where anything you invent, they own. Yep. Well, thank you very much, Keith and, and, and Steve. Uh, what do you have to do before you actually prepare a patent application? Uh, uh, Keith can you, or Ed, can you uh, comment on that uh, a little bit? Before preparing a patent application, what, what needs to be done? Uh, you want me to comment on that? Yes, please. Okay. Um, well, a patent has to be uh, one of the basic requirements uh, has to be novel. Um, and uh, so you have to search the prior art um, to find out, you know, some things about uh, your idea or your, what you think may be a, a unique invention or a new invention. 
Uh, the definition of prior art um, is defined as the body of published information existing at the time of the filing date of your patent application. And so whatever information publications exist at that time is prior art. So your proposal would have to be something new, novel. And um, when preparing um, a proposal or a patent application, when uh, um, you probably did some early searching before the patent application is even made uh, for your novel, what do you think may be a novel idea? So you already have done some searching, some inquiring, and uh, you know this would be um, uh, perhaps searching uh, the existing patents at that point, um, because patents are a major component of the published literature out there. There is a lot, as mentioned earlier, um, of the patents shown on screen of the information on the cover page of a patent. It lists US patents that are cited. It lists foreign uh, patents that are cited, plus all the numbers involved with these. It lists publications uh, th that uh, uh, are cited. And uh, some of these uh, would be cited by the inventor and others maybe even cited by the examiner um, for you know, something that is pertinent to that area of discipline. Um, so these would be uh, definitely places to go when you look at other patents or patent related patents to what you're trying to do. These are like breadcrumbs, like Hansel and Gretel. You know, these are places to go, uh, direction to go, things to look at. And um, of course, you'd have other literature sources as well, uh, patent journals in your discipline, uh, uh, maybe uh, presentations given at symposiums or conferences. And so uh, these would be other places to look as well. Um, just want to comment on, um, you know, the two. Uh, patent sites uh, that are super to go to. If you haven't done it, go to them, um, you know, and look at what's available. The USPTO.gov site, USPTO.gov site. There is a wealth of information out there that can help you uh, learn. There's tools, um, the latest patents, you can research patents, go back, uh, like Roman Haas, uh, I went back to a 1908 patent with uh, Dr. Otto Rome is one of the founders of the company Roman Haas. Uh, he had a patent in 1908 is really what the start of Roman Haas became. So uh, it was neat to go back and look at that patent. The other site uh, is the epo.org, the European Patent uh, Office site, epo.org. Again, they have over, um, over 120 million documents in the EPO site and um, super to look at. There is a wealth of information there. And as Paul mentioned earlier at the uspto.gov uh, site, over 10 million patents are listed there. Hey, thanks very much, uh, Ed. A uh, couple purposes of a search. One purpose is, uh, a very basic purpose, is maybe you've come up with this invention and you don't really know what's in the prior art so well, particularly if it's a sort of a simple invention like combing your hair, you know. You, doing the search, you might find the exact same thing in the prior art. It's kind of a bad thing in a sense because then you're not going to get a patent. It's kind of a good thing too because patents are expensive. We'll see that they're, you know, about ten thousand dollars just to prepare. Uh, so by doing a prior art search, which costs maybe a thousand dollars, eight hundred dollars, something like that, you can save yourself the the big bucks of preparing a patent application. But the second purpose of it, I think, is to sort of know what the prior art is. How close can your claim come to the prior art? Your, 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 your plot of land that you're trying to, to um, patent can't, in, can't go into the prior art. It has to be distinct from it. So in order to be able to write the claim as broadly as you think it 
it should be, you have to know what the prior art is. So Keith, you've done a search, you know that you've got uh, some uh, claim here that's patentable. How do you go about writing your patent application? Do you do it yourself or do you go to have somebody help you? So we do use, um, the company I work for does use uh, patent uh, attorneys to, to help uh, write up and file, prosecute uh, the patents. But there's a, a bunch of things that we do um, along the way to prepare the material and, and to uh, collaborate with the, um, with the patent attorneys. Um, obviously, you know, we document, um, the, you know, all of the um, thought process along the way. Um, you know, when there's a, a novel contribution, what, you know, what makes it novel? Um, you know, it has to be something that, that's non-obvious, why we believe it's non-obvious. It can't just be a simple combination of, of things. Um, you know, so a lot of times we'll start with kind of what is the, what is the problem that, that we're trying to, to come up with. Um, I specifically, um, you know, typically work on three different uh, types of patents. Um, you know, there are chemical patents. I don't, I don't work on those. I don't work on design patents. Um, I do work on utility patents specifically, um, usually system method and apparatus type um, claims in my patents. Um, I, you know, when I um, work with other engineers, with co-inventors, I've kind of got a, um, a method that I, that I use when, when we're putting together things. For system patents, um, you know, I always make sure that we, we have diagrams that show all of the subsystems and interfaces and, and how those things work. For, for methods, I like to make sure that we have uh, flow charts that, that show specifically, you know, how the method uh, uh, works. And for, for apparatus, I like to show, you know, all of the, the components and the, the key functionality, how those things come together to, to um, offer that. Um, you know, and very specifically, you know, try to make sure that the, um, you know, that the the diagrams support the claims, so that it, it when we're trying to 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 go through and demonstrate what's what's novel about it. I often find that um, in our in our better um, patents, you know, something uh, you know that's not obvious, you know, um, you know, after you learn about it, you know, it it, it becomes really obvious, like um, you know. Um, so sometimes the, the, the test of non-obviousness is, well, if it's so obvious, why hasn't anybody, you know, done it before? So we have to, to um, you know, um, show, you know, that, uh, yeah, now that, now that I've laid out the story for you and it appears obvious, um, why wasn't it obvious, you know, go, going into it? Um, you know, um, especially, you know, for, for our, you know, broader claim, um, you know, patents. Um, you know, we do um, actually in, in a lot of cases, you know, I'm familiar with, at least in, in the state of the art in my area, but um, we have the external patent attorneys do the prior art search. Um, and that'll depend on usually like the breadth of the, of the claims. Um, but a lot of times we will actually not um, have the um, inventors involved in that so much so that uh, there's no concern about contaminating our invention with things from um, from the prior art, um, we we you know we we go through and we make sure that we we document um, you know all the different components and why we believe it's it's novel. Then we have a a uh, review with the patent attorneys and and only after that first review when they've done the prior art search, you know then we you know determine whether or not um, you know. Um, the, the prior art really you know oh, it's a, it's a great idea but we weren't the first ones. Um, you know, in the uh, uh, last, you know, in the last few years, or at least, you know, from the perspective of that I've been working on it, you know, um, it, it's there, we've seen a change where it used to be, you know, our notebooks, you know, the dates and everything signed, you know, when you came up with the invention was was very important for, for, for priority. Um, the patent office now has switched to a first to file, um, you know, for, for, you know, who won't, you know, who's the, you know, original um, inventor on, on an idea. Um, so we, you know, so we do um, spend a lot more time uh, working on provisional patents that, than we um, had 10, 15 years ago. Um, also, um, you know, we were, you know, when we work with uh, outside parties, um, we use non-disclosure agreements, um, you know, and, and all of, you know, all of that, you know, gets folded in when we're working with the, with the patent attorney to make sure all of that gets into, um, you know, the background literature that, that's included in the app in the application. Paul. Great. 
Thanks very much, uh, Keith. I think that's important, that concept you brought in of the non-disclosure agreements, because, you know, before you file your patent application, you have to talk to a lot of people about it. You have to talk to maybe your boss, your coworkers, you know, people within the company who are sort of bound to keep it um, confidential through their employment agreements. But you also might have to talk to people outside the company, like you saw in that uh, hair combing a patent, uh, there's some drawings there. So you have to send the, you have to ask a, a patent draftsman who's typically outside your company to make those drawings. You might have to send um, uh, the invention out to testing at a, a separate lab, that kind of thing. So you wanna make sure as Keith mentioned that uh, the invention stays uh, confidential until you actually file the patent application. And the way you do that is with uh, so-called NDAs or non-disclosure agreements. So uh, Steve Presco, um, after you've got your patent application prepared, what's the next step? You're gonna wait a while. Um, well, you file it in a patent office, I guess, right? <laughs> of course, of course. And then you wait a while. You're, you're, you work through a patent attorney that is not an attorney working for the government in the patent office. He, he, he or she is the go-between. And what will happen is <clears throat> after you've got your disclosure, your, your double line spaced, numbered lines, all that other happy nonsense done, the patent attorney who is reviewing it may find things he disagrees with or he questions, or she questions, as the case may be. And that information will be fed back to your patent attorney, in which case they will come back to you in a lot of the cases. And now your ability to communicate really gets important. They may even come back and say, look, we have this patent from this company and you might even have to go out and mark their product to show whether or not there is a difference. The, the, um, this may go on a couple of times. You may go back and forth two or three times regards to the claims and what's in the main body. And uh, if, if your explanations are good and the uh, patent attorney buys them, then you'll get a notice that, yeah, we've accepted it. And probably a couple to three months after that, the patent will issue. Now, the timing for this, the shortest one I've ever had was about a year. The longest one was almost four years. And curiously enough, the ones that were done by smaller companies tended to take longer than one's done by larger companies. Uh, does that tell you something about who has the bucks and who has the pool? Maybe, but in any event, and, and when it's all said and done, you'll get a nice little note back and you'll, you'll have your patent number assigned, the patent date of issuance and all that happy stuff. And it'll show up very much like the patent that you showed us at the beginning where it showed who, who, who the inventors were, who the owner is, who the lawyer was that reviewed it, what the abstract is, what the meat is, and then the claims. Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Steve. Uh, you know, the patent office is a, a bureaucracy, believe it or not, like the rest of the government. So you would think getting a patent should take maybe a week or maybe a month. But the fact is you file it and then you just kind of, as Steve says, you just sit, sit and wait for quite a while before the patent examiner actually picks it up and looks at it. And then this process of going back and forth with the patent examiner to try and negotiate what the claim should look like, this process is called prosecution, patent prosecution. Sounds like a criminal trial, but it's not. Patent prosecution. And Steve mentioned that uh, the shortest one he had was a year that really is short and, and longest is four years. Uh, there's been some that are significantly longer than that. But I think that the, the uh, Tracy, maybe you have better um, numbers than I do, but I, I think the, the most recently when I looked, it was about 28 months. 
So almost two and a half years uh, to from the time you file your patent application until it's issued. Um, okay, so you've got, um, yeah, Tracy, maybe you could comment on the, the readability of the patent. Can, are they easy to read? Certainly that, that you know, method of, of combing your hair thing was, uh, but are the, some of the others uh, more difficult? And particularly the claim, you talk about how uh, claims are interpreted. Yeah, so it may sound self-serving to say that these things are not easy to write since I make a living doing it, but um, there is a, a certain skill to it because you are writing the patent application for a bunch of different audiences. You're writing it for the inventor, right? You wanna make sure that you've captured the inventor's invention in a way that at least he or she recognizes it. You're writing it for the patent examiner so that they can understand it. And, and they, in that case, you really wanna do a good job of explaining what the problem is that you're solving, how you've solved it and you know, better than the prior art, for example. You're also writing it for um, investors in the company. A lot of small companies really are able to raise money because they have patent assets. And so you're writing it so that investors can understand it. Um, you could ultimately be writing it so that a judge or jury understands it, uh, or even you know, a licensee or someone who's gonna invest or just wants to acquire the patent. So there's a lot of different audiences. Some are technical, like the inventor. Um, some are not, like a jury. And so you're really trying to satisfy all these audiences with this single legal document that, as Paul says, you know, is kind of like the deed to your house that has these meets and bounds that explain what your property right is. But with all that said, um, when I first started writing patent applications, we wrote them very differently. We wrote them in a very legalese kind of language that, you know, I think it made us look like we were lawyers and it was hard to do. And so we had these crazy words in there that you would never see in a patent today. Um, they're written much more in plain language. Um, there's actually less being put in patent applications these days because as you can imagine in litigation, every single word counts because lawyers like Paul will pick them apart. And so the whole way that patent applications are being drafted now is much different, but it is not something to sort of dabble in. Um, and I will say you get what you pay for. And there's lots of times when someone may have sort of self-medicated, you know, file their own patent and then come to uh, us as patent attorneys trying to fix it. And one thing that I don't think has been mentioned yet, and I don't know if it's coming up in the outline, but I'm just gonna throw it out there right now is, you only have one year from the time you make an invention public to file your patent application. And this is, this is unfortunate because many times people will call me and they'll say, you know, I've got this great idea and we get talking about it. And then they'll say, well, you know, I, I, I made one 10 years ago and I used it and it was great, but I didn't have the money. And so I didn't do anything with it or I sold it. But um, you have that one year time window and that's really critical. And so, um, you know, that, for anyone who, who does have an idea, getting it to a patent attorney quickly and having them evaluate it um, just makes good sense. So don't, um, don't be one of those people that sits around too long with it. I have to agree with Tracy 100%. I, I'm in a patent litigation, which means presenting patents to, to in court to juries and judges who don't have any uh, patent law background and almost always don't have any technical background. Uh, the last jury I had, nobody had gone to college. Some of them hadn't even uh, graduated from high school. So it's good, I think, if you, it's always good in court if the jury or the judge can understand what your position is. If you talk in words that are just confusing and you don't explain them, they just won't give much credibility to your side, I don't think. So I agree 100% with Tracy that, that it's, uh, things have changed so that people are actually trying to write patents in a way that a layman can understand a little bit better. Even that, though, they're, they're still pretty, pretty difficult. There was, a patent, there was a patent attorney about uh, 10 years ago who wrote a patent uh, on uh, the claim was how to uh, fry an egg, how to fry an egg. And of course, 
you know, even 10 years ago, some people knew how to fry an egg. So it was really something that was in the prior art already. But he actually got a claim on how to, uh, how to fry an egg because he used all these words that um, you, in, in his patent that, that people really don't understand. He took, he took the, the simplest concept and used the most complex terminology to describe it. And by the way, that attorney was um, punished somewhat severely by the patent office for, for doing that because he basically got them to issue an invalid patent. So it's important that you uh, patent be written in such a way that it's understandable. And really, it's a, it's a hard thing to do when it's, um, when, when it's the first and only one you're writing. Um, why not go to someone like Tracy, who's done it for, um, I, I'll, I'll say two years, Tracy, because I know you're very young, but <laughs> you know, she's probably done it for 20 years. So, so she does a lot, uh, a lot of that work. And, and it's, uh, it's better to have an expert do it than, and get it right than have you do it. Why not get the $2.1 billion verdict with a, an expert? So uh, I, I will say with along those lines, you know, it also depends on the area. There are a lot of things where, you know, the, the patent office, if you don't, you know, talk about, especially with some of the software things about, you know, um, if it's a if it's a, a system patent that involves software where you have to talk about, you know, a you know, a processor being assigned for for that or things like that. So um, you know, it there, it definitely helps to have a patent attorney. Um, who knows how the patent is going to best get through there because yes, you want to make it as, as simple as possible to get through, but also um, as you know complicated as required to meet the, the requirements of the patent examiners. Uh, thanks, Keith. And Steve, I was going to mention you've got, uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, you've got 24 US patents and 17 international patents why do you need international patents? Well, <clears throat> every country has different patent rules and laws. If you patent just in the US, then it's applicable to the US territories, not anywhere else. And because of that, you really have to get involved with patent attorneys from that country you talk about using language and using words. Uh, there is such a difference in nuances between how we would write something here in the States and how it would be interpreted in another country. So you really have to have somebody who, who not only understands the law or the technical stuff, but understands the difference between the cultures. And then you have to follow the rules that they have for filing. I mean, we, we have a, a disclosure we go in with, we, you know, do searches, et cetera, et cetera. They, they have some rules that are a little different than that. Now, I'm, I'm not privy to what they all are. Uh, I can tell you that, that uh, there, is, there is a patent cooperation treaty that was set up sometime back in 1970, so that various countries would agree to, to work together and you know, not stop everything right out of the gate. But specifically, you, you've got to watch how it's written. You've got to do it in the language of the people so that they understand where you're going and follow in their rules. Thanks very much, uh, Steve. Uh, and I, I want to just add to that that you, you should be uh, thinking about what your market is when you decide what countries to, uh, to get a patent in. Uh, it's very expensive in the United States and some other countries it's uh, even more expensive. So if you have an invention that's only basically gonna be sold in the United States, then the United States patent would probably, probably be enough. Maybe it'll be sold 50% here and 50% in Asia. Well, then you might have to get a Japanese patent or a Chinese right. patent, that, that kind of thing. So, you know, some of the pharmaceutical companies, I do some work for some pharmaceutical companies, they file in almost every country because the patents are so valuable in every country. Uh, their patent budget is really, really 
a big part of their overall operating budget. So know your markets uh, uh, and then file, an appli uh, file applications only in those countries that, where you think it's gonna give you a nice return. Uh, Ed, um, tell us about expiration of patents. When do, when, when do they expire? Okay, uh, as mentioned earlier, um, patent law now is uh, 20 years for the lifetime of a patent. And that starts at the time uh, or the date of patent application. So the 20 years would be from that point on. Also, as mentioned already, it may take, uh, what, what was the average, 26 months, 28 months. So it's several years probably to the patent is issued by the Patent Trademark Office. So you're down to 17 years to 18 years possibly uh, until that patent was issued. Uh, the other case um, uh, for the lifetime of patent would be if the patent uh, lapses and a lapsed patent results because the fees, periodic fees are due um, and if these fees aren't paid, uh, the patent is said to lapse and therefore becomes inactive. Back to Paul. Yeah, th thanks, Ed. Can we get the next uh, slide up? I think it's the last slide that we have. Because uh, now we're going to talk about the costs of patents. I'd like to hear uh, everybody's view on that. But on this particular slide, um, it has patent fees and there's application fees and government fees you'll see that the application fees are all blank and the government fees are all filled in because they're specific. Uh, government, these are the fees for uh, filing a patent application, an issue fee, that kind of thing. So you can see that there's three different kinds of companies, let's say, that uh, for uh, fees, if you have a micro entity, that's like a mom and pop operation. A small entity is somebody with less than 500 employees and a large entity is someone with more than 500 employees. And you can see that the fees are significantly higher as you go from micro to small to large. And you can see also that um, these maintenance fees, these are fees that are paid after the patent issues, after four years, uh, eight years and 12 years. I mean, they can really add up. A company like Roman Hawes has a lot of patents and in the 12th year of every patent's existence, they have to pay $7,700 for each patent. So company, big companies look carefully at their patents to see if they're still important or are they, are they something that will be important later on. And if they decide they're not, they just uh, don't pay the fee and they expire. The uh, fees for, um, so there's a fee for filing. If you look at, Look under large entity now, the filing fee is about $1,820. And then when they issue, there's a fee under large entity, it's $1,200. And then the three maintenance fees uh, at four, eight and 12 years. Now, the, the application fees vary a lot. That's why the, that's why the things are, are blank. You have a search cost, a, a fee for preparing the patent application, and a fee for prosecuting it. That, that is the prosecution, again, remember, is the um, uh, back and forth with the patent examiner trying to convince the patent examiner to allow the patent. And there's different kinds of patents, uh, different kinds of subject matter, and the fees vary with what the subject matter is. Mechanical, uh, we don't have design and plant patents on here. This is just utility patents. Uh, design patents, both design and plant patents are usually uh, much less than what utility patents cost. But of this group, mechanical patents are the, probably the cheapest and then chemical, uh, pharma, then at the most expensive would be pharmaceutical or electrical computer science, or, which includes software. Those are typically the more expensive kinds of patents. So what, what does it cost to uh, um, get a patent from search, the search cost through filing, through issuance, preparing the patent application, through maintenance fees, that kind of thing? Many people say 
it's about $25,000. And that's if you have, you know, a patent agent or a patent attorney prepare it for you. And obviously it, it depends upon the uh, fees that are charged by the, the patent attorneys. Obviously, if you have an attorney who has a, a, a billing rate of $250 an hour, prepare your application, or you have, on the other hand, have one who has a rate of $1,000 an hour, the price is going to differ a little bit. Although those fees should reflect a level of experience that could make the higher hourly rate attorney a lot more efficient. So any other comments about, uh, about fees for uh, costs for patenting um, inventions? I can add the design costs if you want me. Sure, sure. So it's about $1,000 for the US Patent Office filing fees. It's about 2,500 to prepare and file the application. Uh, it takes about 20 months, which is surprising that design patents are taking almost as long as utility patents these days. But some of that goes to the fact that the volume has really increased uh, in recent years in terms of the filings. Uh, and in fact, they've almost doubled the number of examiners just handling design patents these days. Um, interestingly, there are no maintenance fees for design patents. So unlike utility patents, where every five years you have to show renewed interest in the patent and the fees increase uh, along those um, milestones, um, design patents have no maintenance fees. So once you get a design patent, it's good for the life of the, of the patent, which is an interesting is, difference. Is that primarily because there's only one claim you know, I think it's primarily because the patent office just doesn't pay a lot of attention to design patents. They're a very small part of the filings traditionally. And so when they do things like increase fees or change terms and things like that, they have not required maintenance fees. But I do think some of it has to do with the fact that there is just one claim as opposed to utility patents, which can have, you know, hundreds. So that's probably a good observation, Steve. Also, um the status of patent, whether it's active or inactive, or who owns it now, if it was uh, sold to somebody, um, can be found on the two sites I mentioned, or at least on the one site, the US Patent uh, Trademark Office, um, you can find the status of, um, of uh, a patent you may be interested in. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we don't have too much more time before we ask questions, but I think an important issue to uh, address is licensing and litigation. And uh, I'll, I'll address litigation very briefly, but we think of licensing as kind of a friendly way of, of enforcing your patent. That is, you see someone who's copying your invention and making a lot of money off it, like Samsung was copying Apple's invention, you know? So what can you do with them? Well, you could try, Apple can go to Samsung and say, hey, let's uh, license Samsung. You can pay me some money for my patents and I won't sue you. And if they do that, that's fine. But if they don't do that, they say, no, thanks. We don't think we're infringing, whatever. You have to sue them. Litigation is um, sometimes called the, uh, patent litigation is sometimes called the sport of kings because they're the only ones that can afford it. If you've got a patent, uh, that's uh, infringed by, let's say, one particular kind of product, uh, then the fees for the litigation, attorney fees for the litigation are going to be anywhere from a million dollars to two million dollars. And of course, if you've got a lot of different products that are infringing, uh, it's going to be a lot more than that. Uh, I'm sure that the fees for the company that got the $2.1 billion uh, award against Intel were probably close, you know, probably between 20 and, and 50 million. So it's very expensive to litigate a patent. And the litigation typically takes from two to three years, I, I would say. So it's, it's a while before you get your, your money. It's an investment. And of course, you come out with a, a $2 billion verdict. It's a, it's a good investment. Uh, Anybody have comments on litigation or licensing? There was a question in the chat, Paul, that I saw earlier about um, enforcement in, at the state level. And I just wanted to mention that design, design patents in general, all of them are um, federal 
rights. And so you can only bring litigation in a US district court, or you can bring it at what's called the International Trade Commission, which stops the importation of, of um, patented products from outside the US. So there is no ability to enforce patents at the state level. It's all on a federal level. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think we're now at the point where we, we can take other questions. Uh, do you wanna do them from the floor first or some of the ones we received in chat? Hi, Paul, we do have one question here in the auditorium. Okay. Alex? Yeah, uh, I just have a question. So I follow uh, space flight and SpaceX and I know uh, there was some comment when uh, SpaceX was getting big that Elon Musk mentioned that he didn't want to patent any of his material from SpaceX for fear that other companies would just copy the patent uh, without prosecution. I know that's an issue with international patent. Uh, he's a bit of a character, so I, I'm interested in what your take is on that. Uh, the, the question is, why wouldn't uh, a company like uh, SpaceX want to patent their invention? Is that pretty much the question? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Yeah. So I have a I have a thought on that, and it's something we didn't touch on, but maybe it it'll be a a phase two in the series of other forms of IP. But um, you know, they they might think that they could keep it confidential with trade secrets, and so that's a that's a decision that you have to make. And Paul alluded to this in the very beginning that if you file a patent, you are basically disclosing everything about that invention so that someone else at the end of the term can make and use it. That's the bargain. That's what you give up in order to get that limited monopoly right. And so you need to choose, do I wanna just make this a trade secret or do I wanna disclose all of it to the world uh, so that you know I can get a patent with a limited term? And so companies make those decisions all the time. I guess the most famous one is the Coca-Cola formula, right. which, you know, there's debate over whether that really is confidential or not. But, um, you know, Elon Musk is also very famous for saying that he was going to give all his patents away and let anyone copy them. And um, we didn't get into things like standard essential patents like there are for 5G and, and things like that. But, um, you know, he gets a lot of patents. So for someone who, who doesn't uh, think there's any value in them, I don't know why he spends so much time getting them, but but what you're thinking about might be this trade-off between trade secrets and patents. Yeah, I, I think you're right. So we have another question, thank you, uh, Tracy. We have another question here about um, the use of juries in patent trials. And the question is, um, comments on trial by jury have experiences. Juries had no clue on the scope, let alone the vital details. Um, I kind of disagree with that. Uh, my work in the last 40 years has been with juries. And I find that they are, they are incredibly knowledgeable of the subject matter of the lawsuit, of the uh, patent law, and of the technology by the time the trial is over. Now, patent trials typically run from a week to a month. Uh, a month is kind of a big complicated trial, but a week, let's say, is a, is a re relatively simple patent trial. And during that week, uh, you have some experts from both sides trying to convince the jury that um, their side is, is more correct with respect to the issue of infringement and validity. And those experts are really expensive, number one, but they're also chosen because they're very good at communication, as Steve mentioned. They can communicate to the jurors what the idea is here, what the technology is. And um, after a week of sitting there for you know seven hours a day listening to about the technology, they start to understand it. Remember, it's, it's not like all nuclear physics. It's just a little sliver of nuclear physics technology. It's not about all chem chemistry. It's this little insecticide patent that was, that was made and, and, and how, how it, it works. So they really, really understand it, despite the fact that they're not chemistry majors, they uh, didn't even go to college in most cases, but they have good common sense and they have the ability 
to, to learn. As a matter of fact, when you pick a jury in a, in a patent case, just like in every other case, including criminal cases, you get a chance to exclude certain jurors. And most jurors don't have any technical experience at all, but sometimes they do. But one attorney or the other will almost always exclude. You have, you have a right to exclude three people, uh, three jurors, uh, if you want, for no reason at all. But one side or the other will almost always exclude any juror that has any knowledge of technology. You might think that's kind of stupid. They have to, they have to decide an issue which relates to technology. Why wouldn't you want someone who has that knowledge to be on the jury? And the answer is, basically, you want people who are blank slates, people who don't know anything mm -hmm. about the law, about the witnesses, about the companies, about uh, the technology. You want to be able to teach them the way you want to teach them. And I've got an incredible amount of respect for jurors. Uh, I just had a trial out in Spokane. That's a Eastern Washington, uh, Eastern Washington state. And the folks there are basically farmers, but there's a federal court there and we were sued in the federal court there. And uh, the people on the jury were in civil cases, you only have uh, six jurors, typically maybe a couple of alternates because patent uh, trials are long and people might get sick or something so you can use the alternates. But all of these uh, jurors, there were eight of them, um, none of them went to college and three of them uh, never graduated from high school. They were retired folks. They were uh, house uh, uh, keepers, uh, those kinds of things. But um, at the end of trial, the, the, the judge instructs the jury, we call it, he gives the, the jury their, his instructions. And the instructions are a detailed description about what the law is, what the burden of proof is, what a clear and convincing burden of proof is, what preponderance of the evidence is, things that we, you know, probably most of the people on this call haven't, haven't heard of before. He'll also uh, instruct them with respect to, the, to what a patent is and how it's presumed valid and that kind of thing. Jurors really listen intently, not only to everything that goes on at trial, but also to those instructions. And this jury was out for about a day and a half when a note came back in. And the note had to deal, had to do with a very exotic point of patent law that most patent attorneys don't, e don't even understand. They were trying to make, uh, to understand better this particular concept, which told me that they, re number one, they really try, and number two, they're successful most times. And frankly, I haven't seen many uh, patent trials where the jury didn't come back with a reasonable result. So anyway, that's my two cents about why juries should be able to um, decide cases like this. And, and, and by the way, you don't always have jury trials. Uh, one person has to uh, tell the court they want a jury trial. If one or both parties say they want it, they'll get a jury trial. If nobody says they want it, then they'll get a trial to the judge. But almost all patentees want jury trials because they think jury, jurors really like patents. They, uh, they're, they're sort of impressed by technology. They're impressed by the way a patent looks. If you ever saw an original patent, it's got a blue, uh, blue ribbon on it and a gold seal. And they remember when they, were, when they were in grade school and they did a good job on their homework, they got a, um, a gold uh, star on their homework. And if they were in a 4-H contest or something, they got a blue ribbon. So you, they'll see that patent throughout the trial and think this is a good thing. The patentee should probably win. But uh, they don't. Paul, <laughs> yeah. Paul? Yes. Uh, does a decision by the jury just have to be a majority or unanimous? Uh, it depends. In a, in a uh, civil case, of course, it has to be unanimous. Just one juror uh, objecting would mean that the person's not guilty. But in a civil trial, uh, it could either be unanimous or it could be a, a, a majority, but it's up to the judge and the attorneys to decide that. Uh, 
Of course, if you if you're a defendant, you always want it to be unanimous, because all you need then is one one uh, juror to object, and and you've won the case basically. We have one more question here, Paul. It's it's a two part question. Should I be afraid to share my ideas with others? And on with that, what were you paid, if anything, when you got a patent from your unemployer from from your employer? Okay, so the first one is, uh, could you repeat the first one again, please? Should I be afraid to share my ideas with others? Okay, uh, anyone? Keith, I think you uh, alluded to that a little bit before. Yeah, so um, for, for um, my patents, you know, um, like I said, usually, um, you know, when we file them, you know, they don't publish for the first uh, 18 months, um, you know, um, so, you know, once we try to get as much as we can into that, you know, initial um, filing and, and oftentimes we'll do a, a provisional while we're working through the claims. Um, but I, I do find that um, getting that information to the patent office, um, you know, early is good. Um, you know, you have to file the actual claim set and any, you know, revise any additional content within that first year. So if you're afraid about, you know, putting something out there, putting a bucket out there and somebody's going to come you know, try to do a, a file on with a, a handle and that'll actually prevent you from really being able to market your bucket. Um, I, you know, I would say, you know, that's what that first year, you know, is, is really good for, you know, get get as much as you can into that, to the patent office in your um, provisional. Um, you don't really have to worry about it publishing um, at that point in time. Um, I'll, I'll let Tra Tracy let us know if there's something special you have to do to, or, or follow, to do to make it file quietly, but all of mine file, they don't publish for the first 18 months and then we make sure that you know that the claim set is um is robust in that eight and that you know by the time we file um and we use mdas to to um, protect it um the whole idea of a patent as opposed to you know a trade secret is that you are publishing educational material on how anybody who is knowledgeable in the art would be able to replicate the invention the whole point is you know to put that knowledge that body of knowledge out there and you get that kind of license to 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 exclude other people from using it for a period of time um you know from it so i mean that's that that that's the the um the trade-off you're putting there if you're if you're really really concerned then maybe there are other types of um of protection you should consider like trade secrets I was going to add um on the, that um don't underestimate the value of a confidential notice so if you have an idea or you want to start working with someone, you know, a lot of times people have ideas, but they can't actually manufacture it. Uh, and so always mark things confidential. It's not going to prevent someone from doing the wrong thing with it, but at least if it has a confidential notice on it, then, you know, at least they're on notice that's, that something is confidential. So I, I think that's really important. The other thing I was going to mention is um, provisional applications are great, but keep in mind that they don't, the, nothing happens with those. They sit at the patent office for a year. No one touches them. They're not examined. Uh, and if you decide you want to turn that into what's called a non-provisional application, which is actually an application that gets examined, you have to do that within that year. Uh, and so oftentimes people will file a provisional because the invention isn't fully developed yet, but they want to publish it or they want to do something else. They want to present it. What's that? because we want the priority date we want if somebody else comes in within that year that they don't beat us to the filing date especially since we've moved to first to file that's that's been a real right. big change for us yeah yeah but just keep in mind that it nothing happens to it uh, but it also starts the one year clock for foreign filing and foreign mm -hmm. filing is very very expensive it's you know you're talking a hundred thousand dollars for a utility patent application just in europe um when it's all said and done and so the sooner you file your US patent application, the sooner you have to make a decision as to whether you want international rights. So, you know, it's it, every company is different. Every invention is different. Every technology is different. There isn't one size fits all, but these are all the moving pieces that your patent attorney will, will help you with. Isn't a provisional patent basically a placeholder? Yeah. So I think a good rule on uh, on uh, confidentiality is keep the invention confidential until you file your application. 
The United States, is, as uh, Keith has mentioned, is a first to file country. So whoever files their application first um, gets, gets the patent. Uh, before then, keep it confidential because if you don't, somebody else could copy it and file before you do. So some, and as I mentioned, uh, sometimes you have to disclose uh, the invention uh, to, to others outside your company. If you do it, do so with a non-disclosure agreement because that will uh, you know, protect the confidentiality. Uh, could you mention the second part of that question? Uh, I've, I've kind of lost it by now. Um, so the question was, what were you paid, if anything, when you got a patent for your employer? Ah, good question. And it varies from country to country, but uh, we have three inventors here who can tell us how much they were paid uh, when they got a patent. So my company gives us um, 500 upon filing, 500 upon issuing. Uh, Roman Haas um, has an annual uh, patent dinner at um, uh, Four Seasons in Philadelphia or one of those other fine restaurants in Philadelphia and you uh, can in invite a friend or a spouse and um, uh, that's really enjoyable. And the other thing is that uh, we always have um, evaluation at the end of the year. And uh, of course, one of the accomplishments, you list your accomplishments and things that were done would be the patents that you, um, you know, uh, applied for or were involved in that year. And this certainly would help with your pay raise as well as a promotion. <laughs> well, it looks like RCA was the best of both worlds. We had a yearly patent dinner where all the patentees for that past year came to the dinner with their spouses and, a, and another party. And each time they filed and a patent that they, you got a thousand dollars. Yeah, I, I know some companies don't do that. Armstrong, I know Armstrong's big in our area. <clears throat> Excuse me. Armstrong's big in our area. You get a buck. Just so legally they can't be put on the carpet. So the United States is different from a lot of foreign countries. The United States, the compensation for the inventor is typically defined in their employment agreement. Agreement, yeah. So, so if uh, if you're working for Roman Hawes, your compensation might be pretty good because you're an inventor, uh, but it'll tell you exactly what you're going to get. Or same thing with Cox Communications. But in, in other countries, the inventors uh, can share in their um, in, in any uh, licensing fees or litigation verdicts. Um, Germany, for example, has a whole bunch of rules about what an inventor gets, pages and pages of rules about what an inventor yeah. gets, depending upon what kind of patent he gets, whether it's licensed or whether it's uh, litigated. Same thing with Japan. I was, uh, I gave a seminar in Tokyo once along with a German attorney and a Japanese attorney and the issue uh, that we were discussing was uh, inventor compensation. And the German, it was about an hour for the whole program. The ger German attorney took about 35 minutes describing the various rules. J Japanese attorney took about 20 and I took about three. And the reason is in the United States, it's just defined by your employment agreement. Your employer is going to say, here's what you're going to get. You're going to have to sign off all your patents to me uh, will give you either nothing or we'll give you maybe 500 on filing, 500 on issuance, but that's it. Hopefully your salary is such that it compensates for that. In Japan, they will be making a lot less, but if they happen to hit gold in terms of a patent, which is litigated, let's say, then they'll do a, do a lot better. And in Germany, if you're going to take advantage of that additional income, don't you have to be a German citizen? Uh, I, mean, I, think had, that, I think that's right, Steve, yeah. Yeah, because I've, I've had several and I never, never got reimbursed. Uh-huh. Well, okay. That's okay. Hey, it's just, just wonder. I mean, I, hey, patents are very territorial. Yep. So someone asked a question that uh, kind of a specific question, but it says if, if when you file your patent application, if you have more than uh, three independent claims, that's claims that don't refer to any other claim, 
or more than 20 dependent claims, there are claims that do refer to another claim, isn't the fee different? And the answer is yes. The fees I gave uh, on that uh, one slide were just the basic fees. There's other fees that are required by the patent office, but the, the ones I gave are the main ones. Um, so just keep in mind that if you have more than three independent claims or more than 20 claims total, your filing fee can be, can be, can be more than what I have on the uh, chart there. So our last question is just if you could all provide a few words of encouragement for our students or any of our audience members out there, some final thoughts on advice um, going forward for anybody that wants to pursue patents in their career. So I would definitely say um, patent or not, if you're solving a problem, you know, it, it, it's very good to, to make sure that, uh, you know, you follow, you know, call it the scientific method or, or you know, good uh, bookkeeping or whatever you want, but that uh, you, you document um, all of your thoughts uh, that, uh, you know, what is the problem, what's, you know, how you're trying to solve it, um, and, um, and that you evaluate it as you, as you go on, as you go along. I would like to suggest that that the audience members consider a career in uh, patent law uh, as a patent attorney or a patent agent. Uh, it's kind of a easy career, I would say. It's not that stressful, uh, and uh, it's you're well compensated for it. You do have to do a little more work than you than, than um, you have, let's say, after you graduate from. The sales university, but actually, you you could once you graduate, you can take the patent agent's bar exam if you have sufficient um, formal scientific uh, courses. Typically, if you're a, a chemistry major, you can certainly take the patent bar exam, or if you're a electrical engineer or something like that. But even if you're not, you can take some additional courses uh, coursework so that you will qualify with the formal scientific education to take the patent bar exam. And if you pass that patent bar exam, then you can represent um, folks who uh, want to you know, patent things. You can prepare their patent applications uh, with them, for them, and you can deal with the patent examiner and try and get the patent office to um, to, to, to grant that. So again, the only two pre prerequisites are the scientific formal education, which you could satisfy either by being a science major in college or by taking some additional science courses after that. And then you have to take the patent bar exam. To be a, a, a patent attorney, you have to go to law school, which is typically a three-year deal. But I think it's worth it if, if, if that's the kind of thing you'd like to do. So I just suggest everyone, they might want to consider that. Well, thank you so much to everyone here on our panel, uh, Paul for moderating, Tracy, Stephen, Keith, and Edward for doing an amazing job on our panel and sharing your expertise on patents today. Um, and I, I would also like to thank President uh, Father Jim Greenfield for joining us. And a huge thank you to Dr. Josh Lee and his team at the Division of Science and Mathematics for helping us coordinate today's event. Please continue, we encourage our audience to tune in next time for our next virtual scholar series event. <coughs> we hope you all have a wonderful night. As you can see, we have many, our next event will be the coronavirus and the vaccine on Monday, April 26th. So we hope to see you all there. And thank you again to our amazing panel. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Right.